Alrighty, uh, good morning everybody. Thanks for showing up bright and early after the party last night. I had to like, you know, make sure to pay attention to, uh, you know, what time I was leaving. I was like, I cannot drink too much and stay out until 4 a.m. the night before giving a talk. So, um, the, uh, the title of my talk is, uh, Why Should I Care About Rails 4? And it's sort of a, a talk about Rails uh, and a talk about like the future of web development and where it's going a little bit as well at the end. Uh, so I'm Steve, by the way. Um, if you don't know who I am, if you're not from the Ruby world or you've never seen me talk before, uh, basically like the reason I'm talking about Rails 4 is I've been doing a lot of work to get it out the door. So I'm now number 66 contributor to Rails all time, uh, which is kind of cool and uh, exciting. I do uh, work with Jumpstart Lab. We do the uh, best Ruby and Rails training classes on Earth. So if you want to get better at Ruby or Rails, you should call us. And uh, Jeff and myself or Katrina or some new people that we've hired uh, will show up and level you up at your Ruby and or Rails. So it's a lot of fun. I really, really enjoy teaching people. Um, it's, it's a blast. And I get to travel over the place. So um, unfortunately, I only have half an hour. And there's actually tons of stuff. Um, this is a little small, I guess. But this says so um, seven, over 7,000 uh, commits since uh, 328 to uh, master, and uh, over 2,000 files changed, and uh, we've had 46 different authors contribute to Rails 4. So that's super fantastic, right? Like, we can't, um, so one of, the, one of the good things that, like, you know, Charlie was talking about in his last talk was how uh, it's a community of people, right? And so you have a lot of people working on projects. So, um, you know, even though we, we have, like, Rails core, there, there have been 50 people that have contributed to Rails 4, 4 explicitly alone. Um, so... Since this is RuPy, uh, I wanted to like make this talk interesting for people who are not primarily Rubyists, um, as sort of you know all of us are trying to, to bridge the gap. I actually really like Python. I tried it before Ruby. I just Ruby fits my brain better, so I prefer it. But um, I would much rather program in Python than most other languages. So this is going to be like features for Rubyists that you will enjoy in Rails for, uh, and features if you're a Pythonista, you can make fun of Rails people for them being added to Rails because they're bad. So I will be showing you some great features and some bad features, um, you know, in my opinion anyway, about what features are good and bad. So, uh, so that's, that's what you want to pay attention to, if, depending on who you are. So uh, because I like positive, let's start off with the Rubyists. So like, what's, what's super awesome um, in Rails 4? The first thing is that we're only supporting Ruby 1.9.3. Um, and, of course, Ruby 2.0 when it comes out, but um, we are not supporting Ruby 1.8 at all, and we're not supporting Ruby versions before 1.9.3. Um, this simplifies a lot of things um, because we don't have to keep a lot of code paths around that we're like patching things that were different between 1.8 and 1.9. Ruby 1.9 is a lot faster, and you know, if you're going to upgrade, you should be on Ruby 1.9 by now, and I think that this will help get a lot of uh, older people forward. Um, you know, Ruby 1.9 is a good Ruby, um, even though I do have a special place in my heart for JRuby and Rubinius both um, as well. Uh, and we, you know, try to support them, um, you know, as much as possible. But um, 1.9.3 is the, like, official Ruby compatibility version that's being supported. My favorite feature about Rails 4, actually, is, the, uh, is how much stuff we're removing. So um, the, the biggest thing is all of these things, so, like, page and action caching, rat cache, um, observers, the, uh, and sweepers, um, session stores, mass assignment, and active resource are all being pulled out into gems. And so Rails 4 will depend on them. So you'll still get them in Rails 4 itself. But in Rails 4.1, we'll be removing that dependency. And so if you want to use these features, you can add them yourself. So I think that it's, uh, it's really important that as time goes on, we remove features that don't make a lot of sense for everyone anymore, you know, as things change. I've never seen code with observers that I thought was good code, for example, right? But they've been around in Rails for a long time. So it's time for them to go. That's one of the ones I was working on, was taking observers out. So, um, I, I, and we still want to support people that are using these features, though. So these, these plugins will all be maintained by the Rails core team until the release of Rails 5. So they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but if you don't use these features, you won't have to worry about that code being in, your, in Rails anymore, um, specifically. Um, also, by divorcing these projects from Rails, the people who do use them and do think they're a good idea can improve them without having to wait on the Rails people. So, like, Active Resource has sort of stagnated for a long time because nobody in Rails Core uses them. And since it's been a plug-in, a group of people that use it all the time have actually contributed a bunch of features, and it's been improving at a relatively rapid pace. So even though I hate Active Resource and think it's a terrible idea, those of you who think it's a great idea can, like, you know, not wait on um, people merging stuff with Rails Core. So I think this is, like, a great move for everyone. And I love diffs where code gets removed, right? So from the Rails core, this is all, this is all diffs of removal. So 
Um, one of the things that's being removed is mass assignment. So if you, you know, pay attention to all the, the hubaloo uh, around the mass assignment issue, um, we sort of fixed it in Rails 3.2.1 by um, making you use adder accessible, uh, and you had to turn mass assignment back on. So um, that needed to happen immediately so that you know, we could like, fix the security issues, but it wasn't really the right way of doing things. Um, and so Rails 4 is going to be introducing strong parameters. Um, all of the features that I'm mentioning that are new, by the way, almost all of them, are gems that you can install currently in your Rails 3 app. So if you want to use these features, it's sort of the reverse of my last thing. Like You can put these in your Rails 3 app and use them. So you can do this today if you'd like. So strong parameters changes the way that mass assignment works. So you don't declare things as uh, assignable in the model anymore. Um, security is all handled by the controller. So in this case, we have a, per a people controller. And if you use person.create params person, it would throw this active model forbidden attributes exception. And so um, the way that you do it is by using this little DSL you can see down at the bottom where you say require um, and permit. So this like whitelists and blacklists attributes. And there's a couple other things involved with this DSL. Most people are using this pattern that I'm showing where you pull the parameters like out into a helper method. And this says like what your security is so that it's in one place. Um, this has a lot of other nicer um, sort of effects too. So not only is it sort of the security is in the right place, like I think that this is a better way of handling this kind of security. Um, it means that a lot of... Um, a lot of things that used to do like logic on models in your models had to deal with the security issue and you had to get around it. So um, we have all of our tutorials online for Jumpstart, all our curriculum, and after the whitelist attributes thing hit, I had to go back and change a lot of our code because we had, um, so for example, in a blog where you have tags for your blog posts, right? There's this big join between like tags and taggings and blog posts to do the many-to-many -many join. So when you have this whitelisting of attributes, you could no longer use the really nice like just build all my tags. You had to go through and assign stuff and it made that code really ugly. And if I'm already in my model layer, I don't care about the security of the parameters, right? Like the issue is people submitting forms, which is a controller issue. So I think it's a much better separation of concerns. It leads you to like have nicer code. A lot of people have said in like tests, their tests are nicer now because they don't have to worry about this assignment stuff in tests. So um, this is one of the big changes that I think is really useful. Um, uh, my favorite feature, one of my favorite features, I'm like, every feature is my favorite feature. Um, at different times, they have been. Uh, Rails queuing sort of started off as a joke, and now it's kind of a serious thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, basically the idea is that we have a unified queue interface for anybody who wants to use queues. So if you've used Rails.cache before, for example, you can swap out memcached or Redis or whatever store you want. This is the same idea, but with queues. So um, in this case, you need any class that, uh, that responds to a run method, and then you can do rails.queue.push job, and it will go on a background queue. Um, in a test environment or in a development environment, by default, this will use an in-memory queue, so it'll just use Ruby's queue, and it'll spin off a thread and do that to do the work. Um, and then in production, uh, you'll be able to install an adapter for whatever one you want. So I help maintain Rescue, and we have a Rescue Rails adapter that will make this work. Uh, and Sidekick already has an implementation, too, um, of this queue interface. So you would just install the regular gem. And now none of your code changes in production or um, you know, development. And you get to use the production queue in production and an in-memory queue in development. And it's all nice. Um, this is cool because almost every serious app has a job queue of some kind. And it's sort of annoying to have to set up. Like, this is the first feature that's always a pain. Like, I, I try to put it off because I don't want to bother installing Redis and getting Rescue running, even though I help maintain it, right? I'm just like, I don't want as many moving parts as possible. So this lets you get away with um, using this in-memory queue to develop stuff um, all the time and just not have to worry about the production issue until you're ready to actually deploy, you know, which can be months down the later on a Greenfield project. Um, one nice thing about this, too, um, is that you get mailers that are asynchronous for free. So like by default, any action mailer that you send will now happen in the background in that job queue. You don't have to do anything special, and your emails are no longer in process. Um, this is kind of neat. You can change the queue that you want by using this class attribute. Um, so you can just set the queue to a particular kind of queue and make it work. But um, just transparently behind the scenes, your mailers now happen in the background. So I think that's kind of neat. And that's what happens with this uniform interface that we're allowed to like have these adapters sort of systems. Um, Action Controller Live is kind of neat. So Aaron Patterson has been doing a lot of work on streaming. So you get this, you can include Action Controller Live, and you get this um, response.stream uh, object that sort of quacks like an I.O. So you can write to it and then uh, close it. So this will like stream information to your client. Um, you can do like server-side events with this kind of thing and that, that sort of stuff. And it's, it's a neat feature. Um, Declarative e-tags. So um, Rails has always had pretty reasonable support for HTTP stuff built in. But now you can say, like, I would like this to have an e-tag based on something. So in this case, we're saying the ID of the current user. Um, 
And then when we say fresh when on the invoice, it will use that e tag and it will change based on whatever user is involved. So you could have like caching for uh, if not match. Hey, this, this microphone's dying. Um, oh, stay farther away from the cool. I'm like getting up in here. Um, so, so yeah, so this like sort of declarative syntax, let's just say, like right at the top of the controller, this is what I want my freshness to be based off of instead of having to mess with it in each individual action. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, e tags are really good. Caching, HTTP caching is awesome. So sprockets, right? The feature that everyone loves to hate. Uh, I think the asset pipeline is amazing, but its implementation is kind of crap, right? So like I'm really glad that it exists, but I'm really not glad whenever it fails uh, really poorly. So it's actually been sort of rewritten and pulled out. So now we have this sprockets Rails um, instead of sprockets being built into Rails itself. And uh, there's been a lot of work done to make it faster. So this is one benchmark that was run um, doing rake assets precompile, and it was like eight seconds on the old sprockets and one second on the new sprockets. So there's a bunch of shenanigans going on in there to make these things faster. But you should basically just see a transparent um, speed up of your um, asset compilation with the asset pipeline. So that's kind of cool. Um, the HTTP patch method was added. Um, right now, it's just a really simplistic uh, implementation where um, you can accept, um, I guess I did a post instead of a put on this slide. The slide is wrong. Um, patch or put will both redirect to the um, update action by default. Um, and if you want, you can also use all the routing DSLs and everything else like where you would base an HTTP method now has um, patch as well, av available as well. So um, if you want to use that in your app, so like GitHub uses this for their API, for example, um, you can use HTTP patch. So that's kind of nice. Um, there's been some questions. What's this up? Sorry, they both go to the update method. They both go to the update method. And which one do you, it, so like the default thing is like this is like the first step to getting it in. This was like the biggest bike shed argument that's happened in like a long time on the Rails issues thing. Um, so people basically we wanted like a minimum path that people can start using patch if they want. Um, and so uh, I, I don't remember if forms now use patch instead of put by default anymore. Is there like method override thing or not? But the, you shouldn't. The point is to update whatever thing it is. You shouldn't care which method it is. Is, is sort of the view of this thing. We can get into this later. I have like a bunch of slides, and we'll, we'll see if we have any time at the end. But basically, yeah, there's synonyms at the moment. Um, and this will open the door to future stuff, hopefully. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of talk about like Rails versioning. Uh, and uh, Yehuda described it as like a shifted semver. So Rails does not follow semantic versioning. But here's sort of the way it's going to work out in the near future. Um, so the idea is that 4.0 will be an easy upgrade. It should be as drop-in as possible. And you should not, like, this will not be the 2 to 3 transition by any means. Um, ideally, there will be no, next to no back, uh, breaking changes, um, of course, unless you like, rely on bugged behavior or something, which some people do. Um, and there won't be any new deprecations and point releases from this step forward. So um, there were some situations with the 3.2 series where we were deprecating things in minor patch releases, and that was making people mad, and rightfully so. So we're now only deprecating things in like the um, you know, x.y.z. We're not doing it in the z patch levels, only in the y patch levels. Um, and so everything is going to be um, introduce the new features in 4.0 and throw warnings if you use things that are going to be removed, and then they'll be removed in 4.1. So this sort of happened with the 3.0 release, too, but we're like committing to making it um, drop in and not removing stuff in, in 4.0, um, if at all possible. So that's the stuff that's cool. Um, now let's talk about the stuff that, that I don't really like. Um, first on the block is uh, routing concerns. So this is kind of like this macro system by which you can um, you know, dry up your routes. This originally was implemented as like splitting your routes into a ton of different files and then having the router load the files. But then it was like determined that having 15 different routes files with 10 lines in them is basically worse than having one, uh, one file with like you know, 100 lines in it or whatever. So this is sort of this macro system by which you can say, like, if I have you know, resources that have sub-resources of comments and I have them on three of them, then I can just dis determine this like, trait or this concern that says, like, commentable resources have comments on them. And then I can say, like, oh, all three of these resources have this concern on it. Um, I don't particularly think that this improves any sort of readability uh, whatsoever, but other people do. And so it's in there. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, there's going to be an app models concerns directory. Uh, this is one of the first like, image photo that came up for concerned, and I thought it was awesome. Um, I'm really concerned about how much we're taking concerns and adding them to Rails. So the new party line for how to like, fat model skinny controller, right? Like, so everyone is sort of understanding that fat model is kind of bad at this point. 
Um, and so the new party line about how to split up your fat models is to break them out into 15 active support concerns. And instead of having one uh, user class that has like 400 lines, you have one user class that includes 15 modules and then 15 files that go over. Um, if you know, we just determined that that was bad with routing, but that's good for models somehow. I'm not really sure how that works. But um, So this is going to be a new directory that we will see to being uh, generated. One of the funny things is that Git doesn't track empty directories. So if we want to actually make this like be generated by default, we have to come up with a default concern to put in the directory, because then Git won't recognize it. So it won't be in your repo anyway, even if we generate it. Yeah, so we like, and it's just, it's just ridiculous. Um, so there's that. Um, Cache Digests is the official name for the Russian doll caching you may have seen David talking about. Um, and this is kind of cool. Um, I have bigger problems with this. It's more about the rhetoric involved about JavaScript in the Rails world, which we'll talk about in a minute. But basically, you can do this caching block. Um, so you say, like, I'd like to cache a project do, and then everything in the block has a cache key that's generated based on that object. So when the object changes, it changes the cache key, and it will always use the newest one. Um, and these things nest. So if the project has comments on them and use a comment block on the inside, if the comment changes, that will invalidate the parent um, project cache as well. So um, this isn't necessarily a terrible feature, but um, it's kind of problematic for other reasons. Um, you may have seen this new feature that got added to Rails, uh, Turbo Links. Um, so this is a gem that's being included in the gem file by default from now on. Um, basically what happens is uh, it's sort of like PJAX, but less complicated. So the idea um, is that uh, you, you uh, fetch the whole page with AJAX. It overrides all links to fetch them with AJAX and then replaces the body element and the title element instead of doing a whole new page load. Um, the only thing that it's almost drop in supposedly, except for the fact that you need to bind to this uh, page change event instead of document ready, because document ready doesn't fire because we're not loading new pages. Um, and you can use data no turbo link to override that on any particular link. Um, there are something like like 40 open GitHub issues I think at the moment, and there have been like 120 since this was introduced. So I think the idea of promoting it as drop in is sort of dangerous because it's not really dangerous, uh, or it's, it, it could be dangerous, and you just like sort of won't know. Um, but it gives us max speed, so it's good to add by default to everyone's apps, regardless if they want it or not. Um, so uh, that's happening uh, in Rails 4. I actually did, uh, so people were talking about the differences between PJAX and this in terms of performance, and it actually is faster. Um, it's faster in many cases. I have a GitHub repo where you can see a benchmark and you run Selenium tests um, for yourself and see uh, the difference and if it makes sense for your app. But it's, it may be useful for some apps, but I don't think it's a good general default. Um, this is sort of a good change, but it's sort of also an example of like bike shedding and arguments about how Rubyists get into like pretty arguments. So uh, Active Record Base All will no longer return an array of elements. It will just return itself in a relation. You need to call 2A to return an array of elements. Um, this like simplifies some syntax and makes it look more like everything else, but it's just, it's just kind of silly. Um, it's a minor change, but it might bite you for some reason. Um, so this is a security instance. So if you ever used match to match a controller in an action, all HTTP verbs will respond to that, which could introduce your, you know, the attack surface of your application is larger, so you should be using get instead of match. So we'll be throwing errors if you uh, use match um, without defining verbs. So match is intended to be used if you wanted to match multiple verbs, not to just as a synonym for get. So this is like a security thing. So I think it's good, but it's sort of dumb that we did this in the first place, and I can't really believe that this was like implemented that way. So um, Okay, so that's like the bad part of things. Um, the big question that on everybody's mind is, when is it going to be released? And I have for you a certified, sanctioned, DHH-approved answer, which is when it's ready. Um, <laughs> he also said that uh, he hopes that it's ready by the end of the year, so that's sort of our informal target, but um, we're not going to release it until it's actually done. Um, there's sort of a couple things that are blocking the release uh, that people are working on. There's some security, other security things that are being added, um, and a couple changes of the queuing interface that we're going to work on internally for, for the adapters, not for you using it. So it's close, but it's been close for like two months now. So you know, when it's done, it's done. Is it um, on it's not blocked on TurboLinks. That's that's going right in. Um, is it blocked so, on fixing TurboLinks? Oh yeah. So look at Ruby Co Rails Core. There's a there's a thread about that right now. It's, it's good. Um, so the, I was thinking about like the title of this topic um, and in general. So I always like to do broad stuff as well. Like you can read the change log and see all these things. So part of the reason why you want to hear me talk about this stuff is for perspective, right? So I was thinking about the question like why should I care about Rails four? And this is a subset of the question like why should I care about Rails, right? Um, 
And uh, you know, we have lots of web frameworks in Ruby, so like, why do we keep using Rails all the time? Um, and like, what is it about Rails that, uh, that we care about? I, I have joked, I, I think this is someone else's quote, but I can't find an attribution for it, so maybe I just don't want to be held responsible for saying this, but like, so Rails is the best web framework 2005 has to offer, right? Like, Rails has changed a lot, and it's improved a lot, but it's still fundamentally the exact same thing as like, the 15-minute the blog video is still understandable to us today, right? Like, that looks like Rails. Um, and so... We talk about how awesome it is that Rails was extracted from Basecamp, right? Like, uh, this isn't an intellectual ivory tower framework. It's all of its stuff is, all the things, the features in Rails are derived from real use cases, from real production applications. But this sort of, uh, this sort of made me wonder, like, what happens if you're not building Basecamp, though, right? Like, it's great if Rails is tailored to build Basecamp, but lots of people are not building Basecamp. So, like, is Rails still good for those people? Um, and um, this sort of gets into this JavaScript question about the future of JavaScript and Rails apps. So um, DHH mentioned um, on his blog that like, they don't do anything but a couple Selenium tests for their JavaScript. And this sort of reminds me of what we, when we talk trash on PHP people back in the day of like, oh, you don't test any of your applications? Well, we run tons of tests in Ruby. But now, like, because it's JavaScript, it's acceptable to like, not have a good testing solution for some reason. Um, and it's been brought up a couple times about introducing like, a JavaScript unit test framework into Rails. We give you a default Ruby test framework. Why wouldn't we give you a default JavaScript test framework? And this, because of this perspective, that's why we don't really do it. Um, and what's funny about this, too, is that if you look at Basecamp, um, so like if you read the blog posts about Basecamp on signal versus noise, they talk about like a smattering of JavaScript in Basecamp. So Basecamp uses Backbone as a, as a JavaScript framework, but you don't need JavaScript frameworks for your app because you'd write you know, cache digest and you only need a little bit of JavaScript. But there ends up being almost a megabyte of JavaScript in Basecamp Next. Uh, Travis CI, on the other hand, which is a single-page application and uses Ember, that super heavyweight framework that no one would ever want to use because it's so much JavaScript, only has 660 kilobytes of JavaScript, right? So, um, so there's a question and a difference in like, rhetoric here between, like, you don't need to write a ton of JavaScript. You just write a meg of it by hand. Uh, or you could use a full-stack framework like we do on the server side, and you write a little bit of JavaScript, and the framework does a lot of lifting for you, and you end up with like, the same sort of result, right? So... Um, so I think this is really problematic because ultimately Rails is really good at being a backend for JavaScript heavy frameworks. Like regardless of not having any features specific to it, I think that Rails is a fantastic choice for that use case um, and that it's still the best one that, uh, that currently exists. But I think that we could make it even better and it sort of, uh, it sort of bothers me that we don't, well, some people do, but some people don't want to actually make it better for that use case. Um, I'm actually not that big of a fan of JavaScript heavy applications personally, but I am a fan of helping people solve their problems, and a lot of people have that problem, and so I want to help them solve it, even if I don't necessarily have their problems myself. Um, and this is sort of relating to that question about blocking with TurboLinks, for example. So two of the gems that really, really help make Rails even better, um, that improve JavaScript stuff, um, is active model serializers uh, is one of them, right? So active model serializers uh, was merged into Rails uh, and then was reverted from Rails, and it was said, make it into a gem, and if it gets popular enough, we'll include it. So in that time, it's had 16,000, 17,000 downloads, and there's been like 2,000 downloads for that current version. Rails API, another awesome feature that I was super excited to, psyched to get into Rails uh, for. This gives you like an API controller that doesn't use the full stack of middleware and you know, like, slims down things that you don't need. Um, if you're just doing a JSON backend to a web app, uh, reverted. Uh, make it a plugin. If it gets enough downloads, you'll be able to you will merge it back in. So 17,000 downloads for this one, and, and 15,000 for this this current version. 14,000 for this version. Remember that routing concerns feature? It was made into a gem before it got merged into Rails, uh, but it had 477 downloads, which was definitely made it popular enough to be like in Rails core by default, right? Um, and so, like, this is the problem uh, that I see with, like, moving forward is that uh, because certain use cases are favored over other use cases, I fear that Rails is only going to be good for building Basecamp apps, which, you know, Basecamp is sort of, like, not even the app it purports to be, but, like, the apps that Basecamp pretends like it is is the one that Rails is, like, focusing on that use case as opposed to the JavaScript-heavy applications that everyone is talking about going forward, right? Like, how many JavaScript applications, how many JavaScript presentations do you see at every Ruby and Python conference, right? Like, um, this conference is called RuPy, but it has a ton of JavaScript stuff, right? We all write JavaScript. Um, and so I really want to see Rails get better at that case, um, regardless of, like, whether it is in core or not. So um, I really encourage you to, to still use Rails for backend stuff. Like, I don't want to tell you that it's bad either. 
Um, and you should use both of those gems. Um, uh, Rails API and Active Model Serializers are both really, really fantastic. And if you use Ember, there's been a lot of work um, on making Ember go to 1.0, but Yehuda has an interest in making uh, Active Model Serializers and Ember data talk to each other. So if you use Active Model Serializers and Rails API and Ember, it will all play together super well. And uh, myself and a couple other people um, are putting a lot of effort into making that particular use case a really, really nice one. So um, if you plan on building Ember applications, um, Rails is a good choice today and will continue to be a good choice in the future. Um, but I would like to see it continue to be a good choice, and hopefully someday we'll be able to convince people to put that stuff into core um, instead of having it be this like second-class, install-some-gems citizen kind of situation. So... Um, so ultimately, I'm still really excited. So I sort of ended on this downer. Uh, I left the stock photo thing in the middle of this guy's photo because I thought it made it even better. Um, but uh, like ultimately, I'm really excited for Rails 4 to get out, and I wouldn't spend a lot of my time working on it if I didn't think it was going to be a good release. So maybe I should have ended on the positive note instead of the negative one. But if you look at the number of features that I talked about, the ones that I think that are bad and the ones that I think that are good, it's very heavily favored in the good. So um, I'm excited to use Rails 4 stuff and uh, use that stuff. Um, and so I hope that you are too. So uh, that is why you should care about it and why I care about it. So thanks for, uh, for listening. Uh, I really dislike questions overall because I feel that it like, blocks everyone else in the room. So uh, if you have question, a question or two, I think I have like two or three minutes. Um, so if we then take like, one or two questions that you feel is relevant to everyone in the room and is not like, injecting your own opinion over like, everyone else's time, uh, I will be more than happy to take a question. But if not, you can email me at any time about anything. So um, if, if I don't get to your question right now, you can talk to me and or... Uh, Email me about anything. I already got one from you. So well, I mean, anybody that is not Dr. Nick. What's, the gen- I need a, what's an example of a question that's valid for everyone, and what's a question? <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. People, I, I've, I've gone to so many conference talks where people, not my talks, but other talks where people are like, well, why doesn't it do this crazy thing that I really want? And like, it ends up being this like soapbox for people. So like, that's why I... Last time I said this at a conference, everybody clapped. They're like, yay, we hate questions. So uh, I don't know. Whatever, it's a, it's a preference, but... What's up? Okay, so two years ago, when Race 3 was released, yes. Aaron Patterson on RaceCon said that he's concerned about the growing size of the rack stack. Yes. And he said that he wants to do something about it. Yes. Do you know if, it was, if it's smaller now or even bigger than it was? So the question is, um, Aaron's keynote at RailsConf 2011 or 2010, I forget which one, was about the fact that Rails performance had an issue because of the middleware stack. So like going into and out of that huge deep stack caused performance problems. Um, Aaron is working on something that, is, that will fix that issue. It's not significantly better or worse in Rails 4. We haven't added a lot, and we haven't removed a lot. Like Maybe it's different by one or two, but it's not significantly different. Um, there is some work being done to improve that case, but it is not really public yet. And so uh, it's the same kind of deal. It's like, when it's done, it's done. What, yeah, Jezza? But this issue is 418 because it was a tide related to the garbage collection. Okay, so Josa said that it's like mostly, like a 1.8 was very severe, and since Rails 4 is supporting 1.9, it's not as big of a deal, basically. Is that like an appropriate? Yeah. So, um, so there's work being done in that area, but yeah, it's not like public, and it's not going into Rails 4, um, at least. So uh, you may see something about that in the future. All right, that's zero minutes, so thanks, everybody.